The start of 2023 saw the end of an era for this channel. For over a year and a half, I had a trail camera out at Warnham Local Nature Reserve. Over the course of 60 plus trips, I amassed over half a terabyte of footage. Some clips have been seen by potentially hundreds of internet goers through my YouTube channel. Other files probably won't escape my hard drives. And with the final highlight video published a few-ish months ago, I don't want to let the project fade away unmarked. So to this, a late last hurrah, let's have a look back on my attempts at filming Warnham's lesser seen inhabitants. First of all, what is a trail camera? In short, they are devices that start recording a video when something, say a deer or a badger, walks past. This can give us a unique insight into the daily lives of even the most elusive species. Over the course of the project, I used two different trial cameras, both in Browning's Recon Force line, both in 4K, just different models. To be honest, other than the casing, there is very little of note between the two. Image quality wise, they're pretty much identical. Whilst the resolution for both is 4K, the picture quality you get isn't blow your socks off. There is smudging here and inconsistent muddiness there, but for less than 250 quid per camera, what you get is solid. Not big budget BBC standard, but perfectly usable for anything else. Actually, the reason I have two cameras but only ever used one at a time is an interesting story. Halfway through the project, I was given the David Struter Award, an award set up by the Sussex Wildlife Trust for young people and conservation. As a consequence, I found myself with 250 quid in book tokens. Naturally, I spent it on a new trial camera because books are for nerds. Actually, I did get a couple of books, but most of it was spent on a new trial camera. Around that time, and by complete coincidence, the screen on my original trial camera broke. Now, that would have been fine if I hadn't been experimenting with the time-lapse feature. My old trial camera was stuck in a completely useless setting. Frustrating, yes, but I was able to replace it immediately with the new one, so the project carried on as if nothing happened. There have been many highlights during the project. I managed to film badgers for the first time, a species I hadn't caught on a trial camera before, and a species I'm still yet to meet in the wild. Most of the time, the camera was focused on a badger latrine. Great for capturing footage of badgers, but not always the most pleasant footage. I also put the camera out on the set, however, I think it must have been abandoned, because I only got a few glimpses of foxes instead. Another highlight for me was watching the expanding family of roe deer, when I started the project, I could only count one male and two females, but by the end I had managed to capture a large amount of the deer's life cycle, including mating behaviour and at least four fawns frolicking around. However, I'm yet to film a deer carcass though. Getting close-ups of raptors ripping into flesh is on my bucket list. Talking of which, it was great to see some predators up close. I suspect there was a buzzard nest in the trees around the cameras, and I got some great flybys. And who could forget the tawny owl? Definitely a treat to see. Some of the highlights from this project weren't captured on film. My cameras were in a restricted part of the reserve, and so when I went to service my child cameras, I sometimes came face to face with some of the shy individuals on the reserve. Mostly deer, but once or twice, I stumbled upon a couple of fox cubs in complete broad daylight. Completely adorable, completely unforgettable, and completely inaccessible to most people. Probably for the best? I think my presence had spooked them enough. I have been able to share the footage from my trial cameras through differing means. Most noticeably, I had been uploading a sometimes monthly series of trial camera highlights to this YouTube channel. Only a minute or so long, each episode showed a snippet of what I caught that month. Early on, I experimented with voiceovers and music. The Roe Deer spent a lot of time in front of the camera with the male showing off his stylish new antlers. On reflection, I am thankful I'd never released these tests. I like to think I've improved my voiceovers since then, at least Slightly. The hundreds of views these short clips got on YouTube pales in comparison to the thousands of people who have potentially seen the footage at Warnham's recently built Discovery Hub. You can view the nighttime happenings on the reserve from this interactive touch display. I think it's cool. It's nice to see the footage being put to good use. As well as the monthly highlight videos, I incorporated the trial camera footage into a couple of other projects. For my Warnham documentary, footage from the cameras made up the majority of the elusive animals segment. I like to think that this parallels how trial cameras are used on much bigger blue chip films produced by the BBC and co. Just instead of snow leopards, we have uh, badgers. Very um, majestic. I do think that having footage from trial cameras in your wildlife film does have a big impact on the audience. 
I feel that the static positioning and lower image quality created by these devices adds a level of prestige to the footage. A perfect example of this can be found with the Snow Leopard sequence in Planet Earth 2. The Snow Leopard. Not only does a short making of documentary on the BBC's website emphasise the uniqueness of the footage caught on their trial cameras, Attenborough himself mentions how the images were captured. But now, at last, helped by the latest remote camera technology, we are getting closer to them than ever before. And yes, this is during the middle of the show. A fourth wall break like this is usually reserved for the end of the show. In my opinion, the drawing of attention to the use of remote cameras effectively emphasises just how elusive snow leopards are. After all, why film with a trail camera if a long lens would suffice? I feel a similar logic can be applied to Warnham, a wildlife documentary. The locked of nature on the trial cameras indicates to the audience that the animals on screen are difficult to find, which is arguably the aim of the particular sequence of something. I'm just going to pretend that the use of trial cameras to portray badges as elusive was a conscious effort. I think the biggest lesson I've learned during the course of camera trapping at Warnham is that stuff usually goes wrong. Screens will break, SD cards will come back empty, prime locations won't always yield expected results. Failure is always part of the process, and this is probably why going for a full SD card is so enthralling. You just don't know what you've caught. Maybe it's a badger sniffing the camera, maybe it's deer fawns frolicking in the grass, but nothing is guaranteed and as a wildlife filmmaker, that's an important lesson to remember. Even though the warning project is now over, I still plan on using the trial cameras for other videos. I actually used both of them on a short hedgehog film about a year ago now. And yeah, both of them. I eventually managed to reset the camera settings despite the broken screen. 